40 years ago, most of this was desert. Now there's a glittering metropolis, the fastest growing desert city on the planet, Dubai. When I first came here, none of this existed. It was one huge big desert. Building a city like this in one of the hottest, inhospitable places on Earth seems impossible. So how did engineers do it? To find out, we will strip the city to reveal its secret inner workings and expose the ingenious technology that allowed engineers to build this jewel in the desert. Eight a.m. in Dubai. Temperatures will soon reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But Dubai's two million citizens don't have to worry about the scorching heat. Or know much about the technology that keeps them alive. The city's most visible techno marvel is the Burj Khalifa, half a mile high, almost twice as tall as the Empire State Building. It's the tallest skyscraper in the world. Tearing away its glass skin reveals a hive of activity. Up to 35,000 people can live and work in this gigantic greenhouse. What stops them from being roasted alive? The short answer? Water. 200,000 gallons a day for this building alone. Finding this much water in one of the driest places on Earth was a huge challenge when the building boom began 40 years ago. There are no rivers in the city and hardly any rain. Yet Dubai is awash with water. How is this possible? The answer lies 50 miles to the east in the Hajar Mountains. Geologist Catherine Goodenough knows this area like the back of her hand. She's part of a team that's producing an extremely detailed geological map of the United Arab Emirates. We've covered pretty much the whole of the UAE, done something like 30,000 observation points. We have to drive every track, we have to try and drive over most of the desert, we've had to climb mountain ridges and walk up wadis, basically had to cover the whole country. On her mapping mission, Catherine discovered signs that the Emirates weren't always as dry as today. Here in this deep mountain valley, this wadi, we've got evidence of water everywhere that we look. The wadi itself is, is V-shaped. That pretty much tells you that the valley has been carved out by flowing water. And then we can see that all the rocks around here have been smoothed off, just planed off and eroded by the action of water. Two million years ago, Dubai was a really wet place. Where the skyscrapers stand today, mighty rivers flowed through a lush, fertile floodplain. But over time, temperatures rose and the rivers ran dry. As the desert swallowed the area, the water seeped away. But it didn't all vanish. Some of it moved underground. And today, it's still flowing through the rocks deep under the city. When the water's flowing through the wadis, of course, it's flowing really quickly. But once it gets underground, it starts flowing around between sand grains and pebbles and so on. It moves much more slowly. And also, of course, it can't evaporate as easily because it's not on the surface. So that water can stay there in the ground for thousands of years. And that provided the original source of water for Dubai. The ancient water kick-started Dubai's explosive growth. But it's no longer enough to quench the thirst of this expanding metropolis. Today, the city relies on huge desalination plants, 
that turns seawater into fresh water. But pumping the water around the city and into skyscrapers like the Burj Khalifa is a formidable challenge. Engineer John Zwetz has overseen the installation of water networks into many of the city's towers. If we're, on, uh, we're able to just look at the water distribution infrastructure, one would see a, a myriad, uh, almost like a spaghetti bowl of pipes. Water is distributed to every corner, at every floor, at every level. Using a single giant pump to pipe water right to the top of a building as tall as the Burj Khalifa would be dangerous. Forcing water this high up takes extreme pressure, which could make the pipes explode. So engineers pump the water up in stages. First, to a huge reservoir on the 40th floor. Then, to a series of 200,000 gallon tanks until it reaches the top of the building. Then the water simply flows back down under its own weight. Almost a quarter million gallons of water a day pass through the building, enough to keep its inhabitants happy. Engineers use this clever technology all over the city. Today, John's team is finishing up the water network in the Princess Tower, the world's tallest residential building. They must push water up 100 floors, more than a quarter of a mile. What we're looking at here is the water tank on the 79th floor. Uh, when it reaches the 79th floor, it has already been stepped up three times. In terms of capacity, what you are seeing here is 300,000 liters of water. If one could strip away all of the layers that hide the water infrastructure, it would become evident uh, just how vast the water engineering in, uh, in a large city like Dubai is. Dubai has more than 200 skyscrapers and they're incredibly thirsty. Their glass skins conceal thousands of miles of pipes, sucking millions of gallons of water a minute from pipes buried deep under the sand, shielded from the scorching heat. These steel arteries supply each citizen with 145 gallons of water a day. Water is at the heart of everything in Dubai, and the city's engineers have mastered it. Another massive challenge is keeping Dubai's soaring skyscrapers standing tall on the soft desert sand. This is the most impressive street in the Middle East, Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai. It's crammed with over 50 skyscrapers, more per block than in Manhattan. Each tower weighs up to a quarter of a million tons. But all around and below them, hidden under the streets and sidewalks, is soft desert sand. The big challenge for Dubai's engineers is to stop these towers from toppling over. This is the man who knows how it's done, engineer Nasser Nasser. His latest colossus is more than 600 feet tall, the Burside Boulevard Tower. Now, is this the latest uh, drawing which we have? When I first came here, none of this existed. It was one huge big desert. 
The only way to move around here was only in four-wheel drive. Now look at that. You have one of the most sophisticated and uh, luxurious towns uh, all over the world. The Burside Boulevard is a steel and concrete goliath. This building weighs about 100,000 tons. So that's a pretty heavy load. You need some solid foundations to, to take this load and distribute it. And solid foundations need solid rock to rest on. East of the city, in the Hajar Mountains, geologist Catherine Goodenough reveals the origins of Dubai's bedrock. These mountains are really, really important for Dubai because it's from these mountains that the foundations of Dubai came. These rocks that we're looking at here, these were actually formed about 95 million years ago or so. They were part of the ocean floor. But then kind of huge tectonic forces and compressional forces squeeze that seafloor and push these rocks up onto the edge of the continent where they are now. Thirty million years ago, a crash of two continental plates thrust the Hajar Mountains two miles upwards. Over millions of years, water raining down on their peaks ripped rocks away from the mountains and washed them all the way to Dubai. Here, they formed a thick layer of rubble. It's still visible today, where a road cuts through the hills. What I can see here is basically a pile of rubble, and it's made up of rounded rocks like this one. And because they're so rounded, I know that these lumps of rock were brought here by rivers. And what happened then was that fluids flowed through that gravel and started to deposit carbonate minerals. And that's these kind of whitish minerals here. And those carbonates formed a cement. The carbonates cemented the rubble from the mountains into bedrock. Today, this is buried up to 130 feet under the sand. That's why Dubai is one of the toughest places in the world to build skyscrapers. In normal countries, you have the bedrock at a very shallow uh, depth, so then you go into it a few meters and that would be uh, the length that you require to hold the high rise. This is actually what we are dealing with here when we design. We have to worry about these sands, which are either loose or cemented. I mean, we're talking about such conditions existing until about 25 or 30 meters below the ground. To reach the bedrock, Nasser's team must drill through 115 feet of sand. They fill the holes with a thick clay slurry to stop them from caving in. Then they drop in long steel cages and pump 100 tons of concrete into each hole. This hardens into a rigid pillar called a foundation pile. In Manhattan, a building like this needs just a handful of piles to stand up. In Dubai, it needs 250. They squash the ground under the skyscraper into a rock-solid foundation. That's the secret of building tall in Dubai. If you actually can visualize it and just look deep into the ground now, you would be actually looking at a concrete jungle with huge poles of one meter a side. We have about 250 of them under this tower, and they stretch down to about 36 to 40 meters deep. A building like the Burside Boulevard needs over 75,000 tons of concrete. Casting it in the desert heat is nearly impossible. Imagine in the summer, the temperature outside rotates around 50 degrees Celsius. Now, that is a lot of heat. If you start in the morning, for example, and you hit the high temperatures at 12, 1, 2 o'clock, then your concrete will simply be spoiled. You cannot. You're going to have such big cracks, you're going to have to destroy it. 
Cracks can cause buildings to crumble, so Nasser's team always works through the night to keep Dubai's skyline growing. There's more concrete per block under Sheikh Zayed Road than almost any other street in the world. But without these piles, Dubai as we know it would not exist. The city's engineers have cracked the challenge of anchoring skyscrapers in the sand. But they must also protect them from the ferocious desert wind. Dubai's extravagance is a magnet for the rich and famous, and this is the place where the wealthiest of them come to stay. The Burj Al Arab, one of the tallest and most expensive hotels in the world. A week in this seven-star palace could set you back $100,000. VIPs arrive 700 feet up on the helipad. Landing here isn't always a breeze. Today, wind speed peaks at 45 miles an hour, a challenge even for former Canadian Forces pilot Don Douglas. We're half a mile back, 300 feet above the only deck, establishing on final, firming winds again. As we get lower, I'll just kind of load up the blades and anticipate for a little bit of uh, turbulence. There's a wind coming on one side of the strut and the other side, and then they kind of merge together, and it causes a little bit of turbulence. We're getting closer and slower. Still on glide path, and we're going to start feeling the winds. Hope you enjoyed it. We're back to turbulence. Rotor. No. Welcome back to the Virgin Island. Today was hairy, but it can get worse. The wind in Dubai can hit 80 miles an hour. Protecting buildings from these storms is another challenge for the city's engineers. And this is the place where they come to test their designs. Tom Bell Wright runs an outdoor laboratory that can simulate a desert storm. Have you got this beam set up correctly for these guys over here? Tom's job is to test the cladding that makes up the skin of skyscrapers. And he uses an old aircraft engine as a giant wind machine. So this test today will we'll test for, for everything that Mother Nature can throw at the building. If the system is going to fail, we're going to find out where it fails and how it fails. As he brings it up to full speed, it will be generating about 145 kilometers per hour. The crew add water into the mix, so even tiny cracks in the panels show up. If the inspectors spot just a trace of water inside, the design will fail. So, the, uh, how'd it go, guys? All good, I'm told. So, that's, uh, so that's that test out of the way. This, this dynamic test is a great test, that, a representative of the real weather that we get. It's the kind of forces that buildings have to be built to resist. But it's not enough just to protect the outer parts of a building. In the Burj Al Arab, the most impressive technology lies hidden under its skin. The winds blowing across the Gulf are so strong, they could bend or even break the building's concrete core. So engineers wrap the Burj Al Arab in a strong steel frame 
bolted to a steel spine. An exoskeleton. This ingenious invention spreads the force of the wind and stabilizes the concrete core. Hidden inside the skeleton are shock absorbers. These move against the direction of the wind and reduce the motion even more, so guests can sip their expensive cocktails without feeling seasick. But when the winds blow from the desert, there's another threat, sand. Powerful sandstorms can appear totally out of the blue. They race towards Dubai at ferocious speeds, pelting thousands of tons of sand across the streets. The most violent sandstorms can shut down the city for days. This one caught on tape reduces visibility to just a few feet. Sandstorms wreak havoc on anything that's not tied down. They clog gutters, stop traffic, and ground planes. Dubai is in the firing line because it sits on the edge of the largest continuous stretch of sand in the world. The Rub al Khali Desert. It's not the place you want to be on a stormy day. The visibility just drops to nothing. And driving around in the dunes, you've really got to be able to see where you're going. Catherine has ventured deep into the Rub al Khali on her mapping mission. She's become a master in the science of dune driving. If I didn't deflate the tires like this, there'd be a really very high chance of getting stuck. There's a bit more of an adrenaline rush driving in the desert than in the mountains. It's fast and it's furious. Going over the dune now, going over a dune edge, and it's just a question of letting the car drive. There's no point in touching the brakes, because if you do that, you just end up weighing in, and you can end up in all sorts of trouble very quickly. Reading the contours of these dunes helps Catherine power across them. I'm just going to have to accelerate a bit to try and get up this bit of soft sand. And it gives her clues about how the wind interacts with them. Sand dunes are a bit like puzzles, really. There's quite a lot of information in them. Heading up this dune, I can see that the, uh, the shallow side is where the, the wind's coming from, blowing the sand grains up the shallow side. And then they're blowing off down the steep side. It's quite breezy today, but most of the sand is still just rolling along the surface of the dunes here. As the wind gets stronger, it starts to pick up heavier grains of sand. When they crash back down, they release a myriad of dust particles. These billow high up into the air in dense clouds of driving sand. When they finally hit Dubai, they're not a welcome sight. Especially if you're the man in charge of health and safety at the Burj Al Arab. The sandstorm will build up from, from the inland and you can basically see it's like a big cloud that, that is running up here. The cloud is covering the whole of Burj and we're looking at a speed of approximately 15 to 20 knots when it will hit the Burj. Everything is full of dust, everything gets dirty. Four times a year, armed with jet washers, a daring crew get ready to launch themselves off the Burj Al Arab to give it a good scrubbing. This is a high risk event because these people are completely relying on the ropes and the harnesses which they are wearing. The gusting wind makes this a tough job. It's currently running at 10 knots now, so it's getting very close to the borderline where we need to stop work uh, and get the people back from the south. It takes 14 nights to wash all the sand off the Burj Al Arab and make it gleam again for the visitors. Most of Dubai's wealth 
comes from a geological treasure, oil. Extracting it is another major challenge for engineers. The driving force behind Dubai's incredible growth is oil. The Arabian Gulf region has more of it than anywhere else in the world, but tapping into the black gold is not easy. The waters off Dubai can be over 200 feet deep. And then there's up to two miles of sand and rocks sitting on top of the oil fields. Finding and exploiting those precious reservoirs is a real challenge. Ten miles from the city, in this construction yard, workers are building oil platforms that can take on the Arabian Gulf. Today, engineer Basil Georgiakopoulos is launching a brand new one called a jack-up rig. The rig that we're building here is specifically designed for this region, the Arabian Gulf, where the water depths range up to about 200 feet. Looks like we're just about to kick off. The jack-up rig is no ordinary oil platform. It's designed to be mobile and hunt for oil. Start rolling, start rolling. Traditional production rigs stand in one spot, fixed to foundations drilled deep into the seafloor. A jack-up rig is less restricted. It can float out wherever it's needed and then extend its long legs. Large, flat feet spread its weight safely over the seabed. They hold the rig firm while its drill pierces the rock to tap into the treasure hidden under the gulf. A rig like this costs 165 million US dollars to build and we can have up to a thousand people working on it at any one time. Such a big investment is only worth it because the returns out here are immense. The Arabian Gulf holds over half a trillion barrels of oil, the bulk of our planet's known oil reserves. How did so much oil end up in one place? Answers lie 15 miles north of the city, in a shallow lagoon. This is one of the kind of untouched bits of coastline. And I can see the kind of zones that would be covered by the tide at high water. The tide has left behind thick layers of algae in the lagoon. It's got a very dark, organic looking stuff here along the tide line. I think this might be what we're looking for. Wow. This is amazing. It's almost like a bit of old leather. But actually, it's a sheet of living organisms or the remains of living organisms. The ancestors of these tiny organisms made the oil in Dubai. 200 million years ago, the area would have sat at the bottom of an ocean. Its warm, shallow waters teemed with microscopic sea creatures. As they died, they formed a carpet of cadavers on the seafloor. Sediments settled on top, increasing the pressure and heat below. Over time, this transformed the dead sea creatures into oil. This black gold sat trapped until cracks in the rocks around it allowed it to ooze upwards and pool in hundreds of pockets deep under the gulf. 
It's this geological accident that really put Dubai on the map. In the construction yard, Basil's rig is ready for action. The crew must now move the 6,000 ton steel monster onto an ocean going barge. There's a lot of eyes watching and it's a very critical operation so that we can actually achieve the delivery date. Right side, right side, right side, right side. They have just 80 minutes at high tide to complete the operation. If they fail, the barge could be grounded. This is the first time we try this barge and I don't want to run out of time. At the moment, everybody's sort of watching these ramps that have moved a little bit with the tide. The team floods ballast tanks in the front of the barge to balance the massive weight bearing down on the back end. This is when the barge is really starting to feel the bending moment now. We're just going to go and watch the bow because as the weight shifts onto the barge now, she's going to tend to want to tilt forward. All going very well, actually. The ballasting has been good. Uh, the weight's shifting nicely, so excellent. The rig makes it onto the barge just before the tide turns. In a few weeks, it will join the hunt for oil and power Dubai's expansion. It's going to go out to the Arabian Gulf. It already has, has a chosen location and will begin pretty much operating immediately. This is the latest in a series of oil rigs, pumping more than 50,000 barrels a day from Dubai's offshore oil pockets. Together, they generate more than a billion dollars a year for the city. Oil helped Dubai explode into the thriving economic hub it is today. But as more and more people flock here in search of a paradise retreat, the city is running out of space. Dubai is the fastest growing desert city on earth. But to attract the super rich and sustain its growth, it needs to offer beachfront real estate, which is in limited supply. So engineers came up with this, the Palm Jumeirah, a man-made island shaped like a giant palm tree. It's a monumental feat of engineering. Pulling the plug on the ocean reveals its true scale. The size of 1,000 football fields, it sits inside a barrier made from over 7 million tons of rock. 150 million tons of sand create space for over 5,000 homes, a luxury island resort built right into the ocean. Akil Kazim has witnessed the islands rise from the deep. This obviously came out of a certain need. And at that point, Dubai did have a very short shoreline that left very little space for luxury beachfront properties. It added 70 kilometers to our existing shoreline. This works very well because it's got a very large circumference. The, the island not only looks beautiful from above, it also, because of its shape of the fronts, each front has two rows of houses. So there's one row going that way and then another, the other way coming back. Man-made islands like the Palm are the ultimate way to expand the waterfront in Dubai. And this is the type of machine they use to build them. The cutter suction dredger, Khalij Bay. It can rip over 100,000 tons of sand and rock off the seafloor every week. Its secret weapon, this lethal cutter head. On the cutter head, there are the cutter teeth mounted. These are the hammers that break the material. We are dredging rock, we are dredging sandy material. In this cutter head, at the inside, there is a big suction mouth and it sucks up all material that has been loosened by the, by the head itself. 
better not fall in. Building an island from scratch takes a whole fleet of dredgers. They must harvest more than 150 million tons of sand. A satellite feeds the exact shape of the island to the ship's navigation systems. Pipes shoot the sand back into the sea until the rough shape of the island rises above the surface. Finally, boats with huge suction pumps smooth out the edges. Then the island is ready for people to move in. To buy here, you need cash. Lots of it. The best plots sell for up to $50 million. What makes this unique is that it's got a 275 degree view of the sea. And this person has obviously paid a premium for this location. A plot like this would typically go for about 170 million dirhams. You would obviously uh, be someone to whom uh, money is no object. Building into the sea is the way to go in Dubai. And the coastline has changed dramatically. Construction crews have used over 800 million tons of sand to create more than 900 city blocks of land in the sea. That's enough sand to bury New York Central Park more than four feet deep. The islands have created space for up to three million people, and there are plans to build even more. Together, they'll make the city shoreline seven times longer than it was. The dredgers have changed the coast of Dubai beyond recognition. But nature is fighting back. The wind and currents threaten to drag the sand back out to sea. Engineers must take drastic action to protect their coastline from the ocean. From Dubai's coast, a team of divers is heading for the city's latest mega project. The World Islands, half a billion tons of sand sculpted into a map of the globe. Defending these islands from strong currents and winds is the latest challenge for city engineers. Brendan Jack is on his way to inspect the island's breakwater, a huge wall of rocks that shields the islands from erosion. The team is searching for a recent addition to the site. We're using the GPS to try and find the location of it because we haven't marked it on maps. We're keeping the location of it quiet. This top secret location is the site of one of the most daring projects ever undertaken in Dubai. That here? Okay. Four years ago, divers discovered a huge coral reef, a rare find in these waters. But it lay at the entrance of a busy harbor, and the corals were dying. Brendan and his team took on the challenge of moving the entire reef to the World Islands breakwater, a seemingly impossible task, never tried before. When the work was done, there was no guarantees of success. The coral we had here was what's called a hard or encrusting coral. It grows very tightly on the rocks. So if you use traditional relocation methods, it wouldn't work here. The reef was the biggest in Dubai, with 22,000 colonies of corals. If the team tried pulling them off the rocks one at a time, they would kill one out of three. So they came up with a radically new technique. They drilled holes into the boulders that formed the reef, filled them with non-toxic glue, and inserted steel rods. Then they were ready for the big move. 
A crane lifted the boulders from the seabed and tied them to a barge. Now the crew could tow the corals nine miles to their new home, so they never left the water. Moving over a thousand boulders, each weighing around five tons, was an epic endeavor. The team had to tow them out to the World Islands and gently lower them onto the breakwater, hoping the corals were undamaged. They have been spread over the space of 10 football fields to give this coral the best chance it possibly has for survival and for growing more coral out here on the reef. Today, Brendan's divers are checking on the corals to see how they're doing. Well, ready today? Okay. Rough weather stirs up the water. The swell that we're experiencing today is exactly why the reef is here. It is to provide that physical protection for the islands that have been created inside the breakwater. Normally, a third of all relocated corals die. But on first count, over 90% on the World Island Reef are alive. A unique achievement. They must be on their way back up. How's it looking? Very, very, very healthy. Good, good. The reef is doing its yeah. job. Yeah. Now that coral is adding to the protection for the existing breakwater that is on the world. So it fulfills a function engineering-wise, but also in terms of jump-starting the ecological growth on the natural breakwater that we have built out here. Moving the reef cost $10 million, but it's money well spent to protect Dubai's coastline. Ingenious inventions like this, hidden beneath the skin of the city, that defend its coast, suck oil from rock, anchor towers in the sand, and pump water up skyscrapers, made Dubai rise up from the dunes and become this jewel in the desert.